Welcome to Fossil Creek Nursery and our Zoom class on the right plant in the right place. There's so much to consider when we think about interior or exterior landscaping. Light, space, water, food, uh, temperature, humidity, all of those are essential elements for plants to grow. And here in Colorado at an altitude in our area just under a mile high, but with such junky soil, this Montmorillonite clay is very difficult to grow in. And the winter here is often very variable. So we want to be able to choose the right plant for your need and your desire. So in, a, in essence, the most important thing you've got to consider is what do you want out of this plant? What do you want out of your landscaping? Is it shade, privacy, beauty? Of course, we all really want that. Is it a windbreak? Is it flowering? or fruit production, food production. All of those are relative to the plant you choose and where you put it. The fundamentals of Hort 101 here, Horticulture Landscaping 101, are the same no matter what you do. We have difficult soils, we get low precip, we're often in a drought situation, and the sun intensity and the ability of the sun to be both beneficial and detrimental are important here. So the first step is to decide what do you want from your plant. And clearly there are plants with seasonal, seasonal appeal. There are plants that provide year-round appeal. So things like um, a burning bush, Euonymus salatus, incredible in the fall, and therefore the name burning bush, striking. But the rest of the year, it's a wonderful green plant with no particular value, other than being full and bushy and attractive. However, broadleaf evergreens, year round, they're not sticks, they have foliage, they provide a little bit of winter interest, can be a windbreak, and can be a visual break. So what are the things, once you decide what you want from the plant that you are going to plant here in this spot, let's talk about growth potential. Plants all have different heights and widths. And as a result, we often see the classic of the blue spruce being planted three feet from the driveway. And as it matures into a 20 foot wide base and a 45 foot height, you cut a big hole out of the spruce and expect that now you can get the car in. Now it looks ridiculous and it's dysfunctional and it's unfortunate, but it's the result of poor planning. So the planning part and thinking through the process ahead of time, like the old carpenter's rule of measure twice and cut once, is critical. So first of all, let's talk about when we talk about the objective and the, the evaluation criteria, let's talk about the location around the house, north, south, east, or west. In the decades that I have been involved in landscape contracting and landscape design and running a nursery, I get all kinds of questions and people with all kinds of levels of understanding of how plants grow. So light is a critical factor and it can be negative or it can be positive. So if you were to grow a hydrangea, the last place you would want to plant it is against a stucco house on the south side of the house. 
with gravel as a mulch around it next to a big concrete driveway. That's an oven and a recipe for disaster. However, on the east side of the house, getting direct sun, early morning sun, before the earth heats and the house absorbs the moisture or the, the, the heat from the sun, is a great place. North side is a great place provided it gets indirect light. So sun is a, or the side of the house you plant it on, is one of the most important factors of all. If you're planting uh, a succulent like a sedum as a ground cover, they require the sun. They won't do well on a north side or with low indirect light. And they don't require a lot of moisture. So we always want to follow xeric principles, xeriscape. And those principles talk about like water need plants being planted together. Now, that's not difficult. If you do a little bit of homework or you come in with us and we show you with the way the um, plants are laid out outdoors in the containers, uh, they are often with perennials, for instance, and ground covers laid out in a sun group and a shade group and a sun group that will take partial shade. So you get a little help just by looking at how things are laid out here. And then some good guidance from uh, our staff here who are well educated and knowledgeable in those areas. So what's the next thing? That's soil. Every plant has to have a good medium in which to grow. And that medium might be um, adapted over eons with native plants that grow here. But the soils on the plains and in the front range below the foothills are very different from the soils in the foothills. Where ponderosa pine and aspen and deciduous shrubs like uh, amelanchier uh, serviceberry or uh, mountain mahogany or red twig dogwood grow, the decomposition and the amount of moisture that falls up there create better soils. And the soil base is formulated by the breaking up of those big boulders in the mountains into fractured gravel and soil particles that open the soil a little bit and give the plant an opportunity to develop root structure that's not in the heavy clay. So soil matters. And understanding what plants prefer and where they succeed best will help you in understanding where to plant them. So let's also talk about water needs. When you plant a plant at a bottom of a slope, water's going to accumulate that is either artificially uh, put in an area through a sprinkler system that drains downhill or natural precip that would drain downhill. So plants like willows or other plants that are desirable of a, uh, a, a high moisture setting would be the logical thing to plant in that setting. But Certainly, again, not something like a ground cover like sedum or junipers or those plants that don't want water, not only don't need a lot of water, but don't want water. So you add to that, what is the mulch they're going to be planted in? Is this open ground? Just came from this morning going to an HOA of a very large development that had bare ground and that's the way it was going to stay under certain trees is it gravel gravel absorbs a lot of sunlight and heat but no water it's not permeable is it a plant that could handle the gravel mulch and will not only survive but thrive or is it a plant that will be under stress by that heat absorption 
and not having a moisture absorbing mulch like organic mulches like Gorilla Air mulch, which in most professional opinions is the best mulch to use around all plant material. It allows air and water to move in and out of the soil and holds a little bit of moisture to cool the soil and keep it at a moderate temperature. It also insulates against early frost into the ground and deep frost penetration. So the mulch is very important. And then are you desirable of a very common plant or a rare plant or a native plant if you want just native plantings? That's very doable and it can be quite attractive. And it does not have to follow the commonly assumed axiom that native plants are ugly and it's going to not look nice. Or that xeriscape, which is a philosophy of soil enhancement and planting like plants together in their right location, which is the subject of this talk on right plant, right price, or pardon me, right place, does not have to mean ugly. It's not cactus and gravel. It's simply following those good principles. So let's start to break this down. Let's first talk about the location of growth potential. Understanding that plants grow wide as well as tall and that each has a different purpose. Let's talk about those purposes. So if you want shade, that comes mostly from deciduous trees. And there are all kinds. You grow a fruit tree, most of them are very low branched and they're not intended for shade. They're not something you'd bring out the, the uh, chaise lounge and lie down and read a book under. In most cases, it's hard to mow under them as well because of the low branching. And if you choose a shade tree for its larger growth, you likely wouldn't choose a linden, which is often very low branched, if you want to move under it and sit under it and function under it. But if you want shade, that's as densely foliated as most any other tree, and you will get heavy shade. Slow growing versus fast growing. If you want immediacy and you've moved to a new neighborhood or a new development or you have open space that you want to fill with a shade tree and you want it yesterday, not tomorrow, there are not very many choices and we all know that it takes years to develop roots and to start the plant to grow on its own quickly. So when you choose something like a fast growing maple, uh, whether it's an autumn blaze or the old silver maple, which we don't like to even talk about because there are better options, you gain quick growing without a doubt. And that happens with cottonwood or any of the populous genus cottonwood, poplar, aspen. They're undesirable in other ways. They're soft wooded. They're susceptible to wind and snow damage. They often are thin barked and they're susceptible to what we call lawnmoweritis. When you let the grass grow around the trunk and then you push the lawnmower in and you ding the trunk and open a wound. They don't take to pruning during the course of a growing season because many are susceptible to airborne pathogens, bacterial blights and fungi. So you get a lot of quick growth, but you don't get a, as quality a tree as you might get if you've got a Norway maple, a hard growing or hard wooded, but slow growing tree, an oak. In the case of Populous genus, the cottonwood and the aspen, they require a lot of water. They tend 
to suck them. We don't sell seeded cottonwoods anymore. That's against the rules. And we have seedless cottonwood. They're susceptible to blights and they have shallow roots. And in the case of aspen, they sucker all over the place. But they're the state tree and they're cute and okay for certain circumstances. But you've got to understand you get real good value and then you get the other things you got to deal with that are not so valuable. So a lot has to do with your purpose again as to what plant you choose. In the case of fruit production or flower production, you don't get that without good sunlight. And there are plants that are shade loving that produce blooms. But if you have bright indirect light, not necessarily a lot of direct light, or you have direct east sun, those plants will flower better and more prolifically. So if you have annuals, you don't plant those in the shade. You plant them in the sun. But when they're in the sun, they require a lot of water. And they're done in a year. So understanding that there are places for annuals in the garden. And most gardens could do with a little bit of punch that you get from an annual. But they require care and regular frequent watering as opposed to deep-rooted established perennials that require much less water in relation to annuals. So the other thing we want to talk about is here we deal with a lot of wind and maybe not like Cheyenne and maybe you, some of you are looking in from, from a southern Wyoming. We do get a lot of wind and today is a windy day. And lately, we've had a lot of really uh, more than average winds. So if you're outdoors, the last thing you want is to sit on a windy day. Frankly, it's the weather factor that I like least is the wind. I can deal with the cold, wear bigger gloves and a better jacket. And I can deal with the sun by being under a, a garden umbrella or sitting in the shade of a tree. But the wind's another issue. And sometimes we do need wind breaks that are landscape created that a fence won't work for. So what plants work for that? The best thing you can select as undesirable to many people as it might be are upright junipers. But there are other choices that work well, like a Tannenbaum mugo pine. Tannenbaum in German is the word for Christmas tree. And they are shaped very much like a Christmas tree. So if, in fact, that was the case, and I apologize to you folks, I have left my phone on. So if you give me a minute, I shut that son of a gun down and we won't be interrupted anymore. My apologies for that. So clearly, uh, a Tannenbaum is shaped like a Christmas tree, does not get super tall, 15 18 feet in that range and is very dense and low branched unlike many evergreen trees. So it would provide a great wind break, but also a visual break. Now visual breaks come in a lot of different categories or a few different categories. One is the neighbor next door has a junkyard in the back. And from my deck, the last thing I want to do is look that way because it's ugly. Or there may be a neighbor who's nosy and you want to keep visual eyes from looking in. Or you may border a public space, an open space or a trail. And as lovely as that is, and you get a, a panoramic view, the lower portion of that you want to block off a little bit so you can have a little privacy or people don't take advantage of cutting across your property. So there are a whole lot of things that work in your favor that would be advantageous for that kind of setting. So again, coming in here, looking at the plant itself, doing a little homework on the line, and I caution you when you do that, I would go to a CSU site or our site or a local site as opposed to one created in Minnesota or Southern California or Florida and 
not only will the plants be similar, but the weather conditions will be relatively similar as well, or at least very applicable. So now let's talk about the examples of plants for sunny conditions. If you want a plant in a tough spot, like I said earlier, the stucco house gravel uh, extreme example along a driveway on the south side of a house or a building, that limits you pretty dramatically. That's not a place for Japanese maple or uh, more tender plants or some of the really good broadleaf evergreens that would do well other in other places. You wouldn't want to plant them there for sure. So selecting the right plant for that location is very limited and yet you can create a lot of variety. There are native plants that work very well in that kind of setting like manzanita or a, um, a Rocky Mountain maple or things like that that don't get very large that are acclimatized to the altitude and the sun intensity. Uh, in avoiding plants that spread inadvertently or underground and put up suckers like raspberries, for instance, you want to seclude those in a location that might limit their effect on other gardens where they would be invasive. So raspberries grow from the root development called rhizomes and they produce a new plant that sprouts up that'll produce berries. Raspberries are wonderful and they will bury here quite nicely, but you have to confine them or put them in a remote, more remote spot that won't affect more delicate gardens. So if you want fruit production, let's talk about that for a minute. That can come from grapes on an arbor, and there are several varieties that work well. But the, uh, uh, the development of the grape or the raspberry or even blueberries in a more extreme situation take time to produce fruit, as do fruit trees. Don't expect fruit production the first couple of years that is, is of any real substance or uh, volume. If you want fruit production or bloom production, you got to understand the fundamentals of how plants grow and the fundamentals of fertilizer and what you need to do culturally to get the results you want. So once you plant the plant in the right spot, now it's incumbent upon you to understand how to feed and water and care for that plant, not only in the growing season, but during the winter time, how to prune it and how to care for it so you get maximum value. Whether again, it's a windbreak or a visual privacy screen or shade or fruit production or fullness and value to the property. You can plant a lot of plants that would do the job of a windbreak, but are they attractive in the resale of the property or in the visual enjoyment as you enjoy your yard? So let's talk about fruit production and flower production. We talked earlier about blooms and fruits requiring good sunlight. Yet they also require proper feeding at the right time. So if you can give them the proper food through understanding fertilizer and the three main numbers, of course, N, P, K. The first nitrogen, N, produces top growth. And we don't want that with brand new planted plants. We do want them to grow and fill in and look mature quickly. But if you force that, you have a problem because the plant can't support it. So let's liken uh, the plant to a family. If you had a part-time job and you lived in your basement of your parents and you had a rickety old car, this is not the time to think about having a family and trying to support or contribute money in a big way to a charity. You don't have it. Plants are like that their job and their income comes from roots. 
the ability to absorb nutrients from the soil in the water and help the plant to grow. So everything is about root production. If you plant a plant near large established plants, those plants already have a developed root structure that's going to be aggressively absorbing nutrients and moisture and will be competing against this new little infant you have planted in, a, in close proximity to it. So you're gonna have to feed a little more. If you have things that are decomposing or old roots and they are not totally decomposed, they steal a lot of nitrogen from the soil in the process of decomposition. Anything organic that decomposes requires a lot of nitrogen. So that plant is going to be short of nitrogen. You have to understand if you plant it there that you're going to have to give more nitrogen to the soil. So you again can come in here and we can talk about different fertilizers that work for different locations for different plants. Exposure on a slope as opposed to on a flat ground. If you're planting on a berm, you've got to understand that the water's not going to sit there. It's going to run off the side of the berm unless you have a plateau or a mesa of a berm. And as a result, you've got to be able to give adequate water in that setting beyond what you would give to a flat ground or something at the bottom of a slope that would acquire more moisture than normal. So all of that has to be taken into account. So let's go through the critical factors again in sequence and in more uh, subtle way. Here are the things you need to look at in order. The first thing is, what are you trying to accomplish? And if you have that, then a certain group of plants will satisfy that goal. And as much as you like that old magnolia that grew in your yard back in the southeast, that's not the choice for a goal you would have here of a fast growing hardy other plant that that would fill the need for here so understand that not all plants grow in this environment although back decades ago when i got into this business after csu we had very limited options as it comes to hybrids and each year new hybrids come out that are either narrower and upright like in the case of apples, there are upright apple trees that don't spread to 15 feet or 20 feet wide. They're called colonnade and they grow upright. That might be a great choice if you want a fruit tree and you have a narrow setting. But picking a big tree that only grows wide and is not either dwarf or upright and vertical in its growth pattern is a bad choice. As much as you may like that tree or have great memories of it or want that fruit, it doesn't work for the setting. So the purpose is the number one thing you look at. What am I trying to accomplish? In the case of fruit trees, flowering creates the fruit. But if you get a very early flowering fruit tree, you're not going to harvest fruit because the late frosts are going to take the blooms away and it won't flower twice, only a one-time shot. So you have to think all of that through, whether you want um, more of the look of the cherry blossoms, that's wonderful. But if you choose a sweet cherry, you're never going to get cherries from it. You choose a sour cherry, you might have to fight the birds, but it's going to bloom more frequently and you'll get a better harvest, generally speaking, from the sour cherry. So in the end, it's a matter of choosing a plant that will not only fill the purpose you're trying to accomplish, but will not die, number one. Nobody wants that. I don't want to sell you a plant that is not going to survive. You're not going to be happy. And if I give you a guarantee, I got to replace it. That's not good for me or you. We want you to be happy when you plant a plant and choose it. 
So we're going to spend the time here. And one thing about this nursery that is so important and somewhat unique is we spend the time to educate here and to share the knowledge that we've accumulated over many years or through an education in a horticultural school like CSU and try to guide you through the process to help you eliminate those things that really are not good choices and guide you to the several choices or many choices that may in fact work very nicely. So coming in here is a pretty darn good thing to do if you have that option and walk through and look at the plants. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to uh, send them to me and I'll try to address them as we uh, slow, uh, we uh, come down to the end of our uh, visit today. And if not, uh, certainly come in and share some time. My name is Doc and I or any of the good people here would be happy to help you through the process. This is the most important thing you will do in trying to understand uh, how to create that landscape that will fulfill the purpose and be attractive long term, not just for a little while, and add value to the property over time. So I thank you for the time today. I encourage you to come in for a visit. Now is an ideal, the most ideal time to plant any kind of plant. Springtime, the plants want to produce roots and well-developed roots are going to aid the plant in having a well-developed top zone. So I thank you for being with us today. I encourage you to keep your eye on future classes. I teach some in-person classes here like bonsai classes that I have done for decades and have been blessed to have learned from uh, Japanese master gardeners and always enjoy those classes. They're generally fairly full. So when you see them, uh, they fill up quickly and I would urge you to uh, sign up as soon as you can. So we look forward to your visit in here and until next time, we thank you for spending time with us and uh, Look forward to a visit. You take care.